jobs on the, on the East Coast, and that's how I found the Center for Coastal Studies that I applied to work as a research assistant there with Stormy Mayo. Um, the job description was for looking at plankton. I didn't know until I got here that it was actually looking at whale, which was a huge benefit. Um, I knew nothing about marine mammals, but that was a, a really, really cool introduction. We were, and as Stormy is still doing today, looking at the habitat quality and the feeding grounds for right whales. Um, and so I worked at Stormy Church Assistant for two years, went back to school at um, the Graduate School of Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island, did work towards my doctorate using a lot of the research that I've been doing with Stormy, looking at habitat, um, habitat quality for right whales, the resource, the oceanographic parameters. And then um, I met my husband and finished school, and my husband also works at the Center for Coastal Studies. And so the two of us went back to the director at the Center for Coastal Studies, who at that time was Peter Borelli, and we brought to him the idea that let's start a water quality monitoring program, because the center is very well known for their web <coughs> research, and their research in the higher trophic levels, but they didn't really have any information about what's so important to everything else, the water. So we thought that knowing more about the water is going to obviously impact everything else that the center is doing, and sold the program to the director, the director said okay. And so in 2006, we started a water quality monitoring program. And that is my history with how I, did, how I came to work at the Center for Coastal Studies in Marine Science. So now to get more into what the talk today is about, um, right now, we started, again, we started this water quality monitoring program in 2006. We concentrated mostly on Cape Cod Bay, but since then we've expanded and we're now monitoring over 150 stations for the basic water quality standards, and they're all listed on the side. We, the, the offshore stations in Cape Cod Bay, we, we monitor all those year-round, once a month. All the other stations are monitored once every two weeks, May through October. Um, we, again, the basic temperature, salinity, soft oxygen, nitrogen, nutrients, um, chlorophyll, turbidity, the, the basic water quality parameters that are monitored throughout, you know, throughout the, the state and the country. They're, these are these are what's the main things that are looked at when we're trying to assess water quality. And if you guys have any questions or want to stop me during this, tell me. <laughs> because I'd, you know, I'd rather engage than just lecture. Um, so again, we start out with just basic water quality and that I can't I can't emphasize how important that is because even though it's somewhat boring, <laughs> it's what everything else depends on. So the other stuff that I get into is all related and... and yeah. are there, is there any automation on this or are you just going around all these places and getting samples of them? We go by boat um, to the ones that we need to and some of them are sampled from shore. We do rely on volunteers. Um, the volunteers sample the stations that we can't get to by boat and then we also rely on a lot of different organizations. Webinar, um, Chris, <laughs> collected at uh, all of these stations. Um, three Bays collected in their area for us. Harwich collected at their station. Um, the um, Martha's Vineyard, the, the uh, Sherry, the, the Martha's Vineyard Commission collected. And um, the University of Massachusetts and Tennessee Association collected there. So we do most of the Bay stations, but as far as the Nantucket Sound, we rely on a lot of what constitutes identifying a station when you're doing sound or a uh, I mean, are there boys or what? No, GPS. We go by GPS. Oh, okay. Um, which is close enough. Uh -huh. No, no. I mean, <laughs> if you wanted to be exact, you know, you would probably need a boy. But for, you know, water moves, so we're a couple feet off for refill again. Land is really easy to get back to them. Do you have any arrangements with fishing vessels to gather samples? We don't. Um, sometimes that would be a really good resource, and we've talked about it with some sites that we would have we have issues. Like we we started we started sampling a little bit outside of Nasa Inlet, and we talked about maybe getting the fishing vessels to do it because it is such a dicey area to get in and out of. But it's it's hard because. They're on their own schedule, and the you know, sample needs to be collected and refrigerated or processed as soon as possible. So I can't tell them to 
go out and come back and eat, like, you know, and give me the sound. So there's, it, it would be a good and, and bad thing. It would depend a lot on, on logistics. I was just thinking that they do a lot of cooperative sampling with the state and federal fisheries, fisheries agencies. Right. And it would, I, I go back and forth. I mean, sometimes it, it's great to have help, but sometimes it's easy to do it yourself. <laughs> <coughs> I have a question. Yeah. I noticed there was no sampling up in the embayments around Chatham. Was there a reason for that? Are you talking about Pleasant Bay? Pleasant Bay. Yeah, Pleasant that Bay. is covered very, very well by Pleasant Bay Alliance and Friends of Pleasant Bay. So they do it pretty much the same thing that we do every two weeks. I think there's, their sampling is a little bit narrow. I think they only do maybe June, July, and August. we got to make it through October. So, But they cover it very well, and they have several stations. So we don't, you know, we don't want to be redundant. We don't want to do what's already being done. We, <coughs> We don't want to be anticipated at first. So these are the stations that are around in this area that Chris has been sampling for us. Um, that, uh, we, we started these for the first time last year. These were stations that were identified by the Massachusetts Estuaries Project as their, um, their sentinel stations is what they call them. So they, according to MEP, if these stations show improvement to the level of total nitrogen that they have set as their standard, then that pretty much, or that should signify that the embayment is healthy. So the Massachusetts Estuary Project had numerous stations in these areas, but of the, say, eight or ten in McCoy Bay, the one that has continued to be sampled by us was identified as a sentinel station. And they determined that as long as we continue to sample that one station, it's okay. So that's why these stations were picked, and that's why we continue to do them. Um, so, as you know, as I said, we, we started with water quality, quality, but we wanted, you know, as we're out in the field and as we're looking around, we, we realize that there's a lot of other things that are maybe more interesting, but important, but also indicators of water quality. And one of these is eelgrass. So we started incorporating eelgrass monitoring into our, our, our program. And we did it, we have a couple sites that we monitor for productivity, um, the extent of the beds, habitat quality, things like that. Um, and, and we haven't, we, you know, most of it is on the bay. We haven't really expanded it and then took it down site. A lot of eelgrass has already gone from this area. Um, but it's been, it's a, it's a good relationship between eelgrass and water quality. We also look, started to look at marine invasive species a little bit through the CDM mimic program. Um, again, closely related to water quality. And then the last thing, or the most recent thing that we're looking at is contaminants of emerging concern. And these, these the orange show you the locations that we measured or looked at for these contaminants. So what are contaminants of emerging concern? The, the technical definition is any compound or chemical that is, has an anthropogenic source, so a human source, and that's introduced into the environment and could pose a threat, but it's currently not regulated. So it's thousands and thousands of different chemicals. Um, pretty, much, pretty much any man-made chemical that you can think of is now classified as a contaminant of emerging concern. Over-the-counter drugs, prescription drugs, um, flame retardants, personal care products, cleaning products, thousands of different chemicals, and many, many more. And the Cape Cod, or Cape Cod and the Islands is a very good place to start to look for these contaminants in emerging concern. Like many other coastal regions, it is polluted. Um, it, there's a lot of eutrophication of coastal waters, and along with the eutrophication or the pollution of nutrients and nitrogen, you also get a lot of other contaminants coming in, like contaminants in emerging concern. <coughs> because of its, its geology, its sand and gravel composition, the sediments are highly porous. So any chemical that's introduced is going to make its way fairly quickly into the water. Um, and the lower, the lower organic carbon doesn't take up these contaminants. So once they're in, introduced into the environment, they make their way, way fairly rapidly to the coast. And of course, septic systems, which are blamed for a lot of our problems, they're the main source of nitrogen. And along with nitrogen, they're the source of contaminants and emerging concern. 
and 85% of Cape residents rely on a septic system. So we've got a good, you know, pretty big source of pollution from that. And of course, the growing population on the Cape. More people using more drugs, using more personal care products, using more pesticides, all that is makes the Cape Cod, you know, an at-risk place for these contaminants. And then add that the change in land use with the more, you know, higher number or higher amount of impervious surfaces, the more developed, the high, more highly developed areas, again, another reason why these contaminants are uh, you know, prevalent here on the Cape So the study that brought contaminants of the emergency concern to the forefront was done by USGS back in 2002. And they did a nationwide assessment of 139 streams, some of these were located in Massachusetts, and they tested these, these streams for many, many different types of contaminants of the emergency concern and found in 80% of these streams, they found at least one contaminant. So this shows they're out there, but even more than that, they have, they've obviously been out there for longer, you know, before 2002, but we now have the technology to detect these chemicals at the low concentrations that they are found. So once USGS showed that they're out there, be careful, Silent Spring um, stepped in and looked specifically at, at on Cape Cod. They, in 2006, they looked at um, six different ponds on Cape Cod and found contaminants in many of them. They also showed a relationship, this study showed a relationship between the density of development and contaminants, so the more highly de developed areas around the, you know, the, those ponds had higher levels of contaminants and emerging concern. And then in 2010, they tested um, public wells all over the Cape and in 75% of the wells they tested, they found at least one contaminant of emerging concern. 2011, they tested some private wells, and in these wells, of the wells that they tested, I think 85% had at least one contaminant of the emerging concern. And the levels that they found were levels um, similar in concentration to some of the highest levels found in the rest of the country. So it's, they're here. <laughs> just, just a quick yes. thought, I mean, mm -hmm. when you're talking about contaminants now, these mm -hmm. are below what, these are at levels that are below what the local water districts publish and say are safe. And so well, they're unregulated. Uh, I see. So these are not things they test for. They are not tested for, and they have not set any okay. regulations okay. about what levels are safe or not. Um, so we jumped on board in 2010, you know, based on the other, the previous work by Silent Spring that showed that there were detectable levels of contaminants in ponds and in groundwater, since groundwater and surface water all eventually make its way to the coastline, and we would assume that they're also in our coastal waters. So that's when we became interested, um, and in 2010, we just did a very, very preliminary look to see if we could detect um, these chemicals in our coastal waters. And we chose a couple different sites in Cape Cod, and then one out in the middle of Cape Cod Bay, and we did fine. We, we were able to detect. We only measured for a couple, the ones that would be most likely to be found, and we based that on their persistence in the environment. Um, a lot of these chemicals can be broken down from microbial activity, or exposure to oxygen, or can absorb to sediment. So it's, a lot of the chemicals can be taken care of biologically, but some of them can't. And so we picked four or five that were, were likely to persist in the environment and make, make their way to the coastal waters. So again, I want to emphasize very, very, very low concentrations. So one of the chemicals that was more prevalent was carbamethamine, and that was found in the average concentration of about seven nanograms per liter. And nanogram per liter is one part per trillion. So that's super, super low. So just comparing it to what we, you know, everyday language, a dose of carbamazepine is 400 milligrams per liter. To get that amount into your system, the <coughs> concentration that we measured in our water, you would have to drink 57 million liters, <laughs> which is equal to 23 is a little bit to get one dose. So very, very, very low levels. And again, the only reason that we can detect, detect them is that we have super advanced technology that can pretty much measure anything. 
So, but once we determine that they, we can detect them, that they are out there, <coughs> we got funding from, from the Massachusetts Bay Program and from the Massachusetts Environmental Trust to go into a little bit more depth about um, where they are, how their concentrations vary across seasons or um, you know, within regions, and we did find um, temporal trends. We found higher concentrations during the summer compared to the spring and the fall, which makes more sense with more people um, here. And we found, uh, similar to what Silent Spring found, we found a relationship between density of development, so Jones River, which is a highly, you know, developed, high density development around that compared to some of the other regions, um, had higher concentrations of these contaminants. And we also sampled within a watershed the higher you were up the watershed, so the further away from the mouth, the higher the concentration. So you didn't, you know, the areas that were more well flushed and less developed had lower concentrations of carbon of, of these contaminants than higher Yes. Are you taking into consideration the nuclear plant in Pilgrim and what is being exuded into the water from <laughs> there? We have not. That's what I have understood. It's right. not being done. Um, it's not, and we've been encouraged to start looking. Mm -hmm. Even you know, when I showed the map of our stations, our, our closest station is still too far away from from that to say anything about it. I don't know. Well, the interesting thing is in Yarmouth, Port, where I come from, so mm -hmm. right there in the Sandy Neck area, mm -hmm. things have changed within the marsh. So we swim in there all the time, and I've done it forever. And now we find that there is a snail that is disappearing, and as a consequence, the water is being filled with these water fleas. I can't remember what you call them, but they're biting us. And we're wondering what has killed you know, the snails. Is, it, is anybody looking at that? Have you, is, mm -hmm. is the town looking at that or is anybody? I doubt it. <laughs> it's worth looking into. I, I don't know if I would jump to the contaminants being the cause. I would more, you know, jump to something a more a more common pollutant, you know, or but uh, you never but I know. I think it's pretty. I mean, you think it's really where that where that's being located, right. you know, from Plymouth, the, a lot of stuff could collect within that marshy area there. Right. It's, yeah, it's definitely worth looking into. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the one thing that I should say is that this is extremely expensive <laughs> analysis to, to get done. So that's why we started looking at just a couple compounds. Mm -hmm. um, so for the previous slide and for this slide of our stations that we sampled around in Town, we only sampled for four or five, well, actually five, one of them was just detected. But uh, we only sampled for four compounds. And again, we, we chose these compounds based on their likely likelihood of persisting in the environment as well as their use. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is this, I assume, all just dissolved contaminants? Dissolved. We aren't sampling uh, benthic or modern? We, we're not sampling sediments. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, we do a little bit about bioaccumulation that I'm going to talk about later. Mm -hmm. We sample some of the shellfish, but right now we started out with just looking at water. You sample for the contents of American concern that they have a joint based kit kind of like the perfluorinated chemicals we and perchlorate? Right, they, they're doing, that's a wonderful research site. They're doing, they're tracing the wastewater from the joint based kit cup. Um, and they're sampling for contents of American concern as well as purple, you know, everything, hugely. We are concentrating on the more hydro fillet. No, hydrophobic compounds. <laughs> so we're staying away from the PVCs and perfluorates and you know, silent spring has done a lot of that, but we're concentrating on the hydrophilic ones. Why is Stuart Lower so predominant over there? You know, all those things. Just... Right, that has huge concentrations yeah, of carbon mass. Yeah, and other things. And other things. Um, that was, Mark remind me on this, they, it was oh. closed, the cover was very, very small. Right. So it was basically just a, 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 a mole. And if you know where it is, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of residents around it. And I think, is it like 50% of the wastewater treatment effluent is directed into there, too? Oh. On the groundwater? Yeah, I think so. I'm not sure, but it's, 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 a, it's a lot of residents around it. A lot of residents. Without flushing. 
And then, re was it just last year that the Army Corps yeah. opened the cohort? Yeah. So now it's a lot more flushed. Um, okay, so that's next to Lewis Bridge. That's Hyannis, right? Is it? Yeah, yeah that's, it's... <laughs> that's really Hyannis, right? There. Right, okay. yeah. Okay. So it's mm -hmm. on this side of Lewis Bay. Yeah. Um, so, um, so again, we said talking about skiing is probably one of the, the more... Um, one of the compounds that sticks out the most in our test it seems to be in most of the samples. Um, so we've, we've kind of focused on that with some of our analysis. We find sulfonethoxyl, it's one of the more persistent compounds. So these are, what, what are the sources of these usually? Are these like cleaning products? Those two are drugs. Um, Carbonazepine is an anti-seizure drug. Um, is it? An anti, I think anti-seizure antidepressant can be used. Sulfamethoxyl is an antibiotic. Um, and then cottonine is a, um, is a metabolite of nicotine. So it's once your body has processed nicotine, the cottonine is a metabolite of that. And then, of course, it's even medicine. Um, so so for in this work, we wanted to look a little bit more in depth at some of these stations, but again, because of the cost for measuring, for just measuring for four or five chemicals, it's three or four hundred dollars a sample. We wanted to measure for a, a bigger suite of samples, and that would have cost, or a bigger suite of contaminants, and that cost about two thousand dollars a sample. So we obviously couldn't stick with all the stations. So we, oh, before I get into that, we found a really good correlation between dissolving organic nitrogen and levels of contaminants and emerging concern. So, um, again, giving cred credence to the fact that septic systems, are, where you have high, higher sources of nitrogen, you're also going to have higher sources or higher levels of these types of So anyway, we wanted to narrow down the sites um, so we could focus more on the more contaminated sites to go to look for different contaminants. So, for example, in the, the areas that we tested around Falmouth, or, you know, West Falmouth, or Low Pond, Great Pond, Warm Pond, and McCoy Bay, these were the levels of carbon masking we found. Um, we tested it both in July and in October. Looking at McCoy Bay, there really wasn't much, so we didn't go further yet in this, in McCoy Bay to test. But then if you look at Little Pond, that had, you know, fairly high levels. So Little Pond was one of the areas that we focused on to do further. Testing. Um, these are all the chemicals that we test for. There's 73. There is some hormones, but most of them are pharmaceuticals and personal care products. And this is what we found. So we, we narrowed our 25 sites down to 10 sites. And we, of the 73 chemicals that we tested for, we found 17. Seven of those are hormones, 10 of those were pharma, pharmaceuticals or personal care products. For the hormones, estrone was found in the highest concentration, but progesterone was the most prevalent, was found in the most sites. For the pharmaceuticals and personal care products, beet, which is only green, was found in the highest concentration, but the derivative of nicotine was found at almost all the sites. So that was the more prevalent. So is the estrogen, the progesterone, um, birth control pills? They're naturally occurring. So they're found in organisms too. Oh, okay. So you can't, the hormones are a little bit dicey about, you know, to say if they're human or naturally in the environment. So it's hard to, but for the other ones, the person who comes from PPs, they're, they're only sources of us. So it's easier to make, you know, conclusions based on that. So we wanted to go again a little bit further. So we looked at, um, bioaccumulation and with the use of passive samplers and oysters. Because all our work before that has been used, you know, based on one discrete sample. One liter of water taken at one point in time. And it gives you some information, but it really doesn't give you as much information as you'd like. So we turn to another source of technology, passive samplers, and accompany those with oysters. Um, oysters are an ideal organism to use for this because they filter up to 50 gallons of water a day and they can live in a variety of conditions. You can find, you find them in very contaminated areas and find them in clean areas, so we weren't concerned about them being able to survive in the, the, the locations that we put them. And then the passive sampling we use 
It's called the Tosis Sampler. Um, it was developed by, I think it was developed by USGS and it's now made by EST Laboratories. And um, that, so we put these two things out simultaneously because the Tosis supposedly is going to take up everything that's there. The oysters might be a little bit more, a little bit different. What accumulates in an oyster might not necessarily be the same. So the process sampler should take up everything. The oyster may not take up anything. Because again, like I said, these, these compounds are hydrophilic, so they're water, water loving. Oysters would, would be more likely to take up the fat soluble stuff, so like the PCBs or the flame retardants. They may or may not take up the hydrophilic, and there hasn't been much work to show whether a shellfish do accumulate these. So this was kind of like a, a, a new thing for us to do. <coughs> the POSA sampler is POSA stands for Polar Organic Chemical Integrative Sampler. Um, they, they have another sampler that does the hydrophobic <laughs> compound. POSA was designed, designed to do the hydrophilic because that's what we've been looking at in our previous work. We stuck with So from the 10 sites that we had, that we did the genome testing for the 73 contaminants. We narrowed that down to four sites on, um, on the South Shore of Nantucket Town, and we chose one on Nantucket and one on Martha Saint, just to give a, a broad view of what, what's there. We also had one out in the middle of Nantucket Town. Um, again, Little Pond, we, we kept that one in. So this is. Um, this is the, the Postless canister. We put six different membranes in there. Um, we put that many because we anticipated low concentration, so we wanted as much surface area as we could. And then this is a cage with 70 oysters in it. We deployed them like that. And then 40 days later, we went out and retrieved them. So it gave you, this is going to give you a time weighted average over a period of 40 days. So it's going to hopefully capture, you know, more runoff events or dry periods or it won't tell you what happens when, but it'll give you a, you know, a more average look at what's going on. So we retrieved the oysters. The posters we immediately sent back to EST Labs and they did the extraction and the, um, the analysis for those. For the oysters, we did a little bit of stuff on our own. We did um, weights, shell height, um, prop proximal analysis, and then we sent the tissue out for Hamilton and Origin Center. These are the, um, the five of the sites that we looked at, and you can see, just looking at the oysters, very, very different. They're all left out for the same amount of time, but just the environment that they're in was, was different. And I'm not saying that's related to levels of contaminants and emerging concerns. It's probably more related to levels of food or temperature or whatever. But it was, it was, it was kind of a shock to, to us to see that there are such big differences in, in the oyster space somewhere they were put. So once we got the data back, this is what it looked like. This is the hormones. Um, again, all these hormones are naturally occurring. So they could already be in the, in the shellfish or in the oysters. So I really can't say much about that. But for the pharmaceutical and personal care products, they there were contaminants that were bioaccumulated by the oysters. Not as many that were found in the post samplers, but there were still some. So um, the ones shown in black, written in the text that's in black, those are the, the contaminants that were found in both the post samplers and the oysters. The ones shown in blue were found in just the post samplers, and the ones shown in red were found in just the oysters. And this just gives you the list of the different contaminants and their main uses. So getting back to the oysters, like I emphasized with the water, you should not be scared of eating an oyster. <laughs> the, the concentrations that we found, average concentration in the oysters, I did some calculations, so for a 15, uh, an average oyster, 15 gram oyster, you would have to eat 230,000 to get the amount of caffeine in one cup of coffee. <laughs> so, <laughs> somebody, somebody said so I'd much rather just drink a cup of coffee. <laughs> you have to eat 50,000 oysters to get the amount of nicotine in one cigarette. <coughs> you have to eat 
78,000 oysters to get them out of the Ogro mine in a bar of chocolate. So very, very, very low levels. So don't walk away with it saying I can't eat oysters anymore. <laughs> so the bottom line of this is basically see, see, they are present in our crystal waters. They probably have been for many, many years. But now that we have the technology to protect them, we know that they're, we, we can measure them. Concentrations are linked to degree of human use, so be careful what you use. Um, one, you know, one thing you don't want to do is flush pharmaceutical down the toilet. They do have take back drug take back programs. Take advantage of that. You know, don't use person, a lot of useless personal care products. Be careful with your cleaning products. You know, just be smart in your use because they don't go away just because you form down the sink. They're still there and they're, they're going to affect or impact our environment. There is evidence of bioaccumulation of some, but not all contaminants of emerging concern. This, this was um, done by uh, Baylor University. So they tested fish um, in Chicago, downstream of the sewage treatment plant. And the pills represent the percentage of each of the drugs that was found in the fish. So that was a really neat study, a really cool picture, a good way to display things. But I should also say that, so we measured shellfish, and we found bioaccumulation. But that doesn't necessarily imply biomagnification. So just because it's in the shellfish tissue at the point that we measure them, doesn't mean that they don't metabolize them and pass them through. And so it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily make its way up the food chain, just because we found them there. So that more work needs to be done, you know, with that. And again, the closely associated with waste water, the source, you know, separate systems, which is not the primary source of nitrogen, are probably also the primary source of these contaminants of emerging return. Also, what we don't know is baseline data. So we have, you know, it's important to establish this baseline data. It's hard because it is so expensive to, to analyze these samples, but it, there is definitely a need out there because it's only going to get worse. You know, our, the number of prescriptions going up, the sales of over-the-counter drugs is going up, everything is increasing, our use of, of these cleaning products is all going up, and of course the population is, is increasing too, so there's only going to be more higher concentrations. We also need to understand better the current state transport system, system of these contaminants in the environment, and then environmental impacts. We don't know, so they are found at very, very, very low levels. But we don't, there's a whole mixture of them. So even though, you know, the level it, it, of one isn't a bad thing, we don't know if, when they combine with other contaminants if it's a synergistic effect, if it's actually going to amplify it. Um, so there, we, there needs to be a lot more work on what is, you know, the impacts on the environment and on the ecology of these things. And like I said, right now they're largely unregulated. Um, I, I don't think any of the ones that we tested for are regulated, in, even in drinking water. But the environmental protection service, that, at both federal and state levels, and we're starting to there's they're starting to become aware of them. So the environmental protection service has actually added some of these to their candidate contaminant list that could possibly be measured in the future. It you know it takes the federal government a long time to do anything, <laughs> um, so it'll probably be a very very long time before there actually is our level set. Yeah. Are there any you found that are of concern because they, they are in, in that quantity could be an issue? I, I don't know. Because there, there's no level set. Um, all we can do is compare it to other areas. And like Silent Spring studies show levels in some of the private well and public wells that were equivalent to some of the higher levels measured throughout the country. So all we know is that we're on the higher end compared to other parts of the country. But I don't know how high is too high. Yeah. One of the ways uh, to address this is to um, look at uh, some particular water bodies or harbors uh, uh, which show the significant deterioration of uh, conditions, say, over the say, past 10 years or so, and compare them. Um, Try to find if there are any of these chemicals. 
that would be good. But uh, there's so much going on. You know, you could, I don't think you. I think it'd be hard to say. You know, the loss of of mackerel in this harbor is directly related to the higher concentrations <laughs> of carbon methane. Well, you, you you'll be able to see if there are any unusually high amounts of uh, right. some chemicals um, which can cause uh, the problem. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's getting fun to do that too. <laughs> oh, it's an issue. Um, I realize it's not the same thing, but um, all of the water departments do regulate, or they do a lot of significant water testing. And although it's um, not analogous to what you're doing, there might be valuable data there, particularly when you're looking at it uh, Cape High and making comparisons. Yeah, and it's free, it's mm -hmm. available. Um, just walk in and ask for the results. Mm -hmm. And they uh, monitor regularly. Some of it is quarterly, and some of it is weekly in the summer or bi-weekly in the winter. Mm -hmm. And um, have you taken advantage of any of that just to get a bigger picture of other contaminants or potential contaminants, particularly in view of the fact that it is publicly available and readily accessible? I haven't. I would assume that, because it's how it's brain look more at human, in, you know, wells, and mm -hmm. public, so they look more at the human side of things. Um, we concentrate more on coastal okay. stuff. It would be great, that's what we, so with all these samples we collected a coincident water quality sample and we were basically, we were hoping that there would be a really strong correlation between, you know, ammonium mm -hmm. and this, and then you could use that because it's a lot cheaper to measure for ammonium, you could use that and get a better idea of, and unfortunately, I mean, we did find a correlation, it, a fairly strong correlation, but it wasn't enough to say, if, if this sample has high nitrogen, I know for a fact that it's also going to be very high in carbon nitrogen. Well, this reminds me of what you're doing, um, a great deal of what, back in the 30s, I think it was, when a scientist began measuring the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from la da and then right. look at what's going on now. <laughs> you know, so I see that, you know, what's happening now may not have a major import, but uh, down the road uh, would probably be very, very significant. Right, and, and you know, it's only going to get cheaper, I, I hope, to, to mm -hmm. make these sense. You know, 10 years from now, what costs $3,000 now mm -hmm. should only cost maybe a thousand. But, you know, so it, I think it's, it's becoming more prevalent. It's going to get cheaper and easier to, end, I hope, to analyze for this stuff. Are, are we the only country in the world that's doing this work, or is no. there a large number of countries there that are, are doing it? And do you have international comparisons that yes. you can use? Yes, other countries are definitely looking at I want to ask you something about the telogenin, the egg protein that's found in that fish. Mm -hmm. Is there any connection? Is there a similar kind of system in oysters that will allow you? like the hormones, the possible effects in the organism? Well, we were, we were hoping, we, we did test for, I think, one hormone that was not naturally occurring. And we were really hoping that that, that would be one of the ones that showed up and then we could say more. But every hormone that we found was naturally found in the moisture. So I can't say if those levels were normal or high. It's quite common in fit, male fish that have the telogenin that they're exposed to sewage at form. Right. Um, oysters are hermaphroditic, correct? So they're going to have both the male and the female mm -hmm. hormones. So whereas male fish may not have, you know, so it might be easier to test for female hormones in male fish. Instead of well, it's certainly easier. <laughs> so, so, yeah. I mean, some male fish actually have female sexual organs in, mm -hmm. in the worst case scenario. Okay. It's fairly common that they have the levels of the egg, female egg protein in their blood serum. Mm -hmm. Just as a really an aside, <clears throat> truly there is no way of remediating this. You know, sewage disposal or sewage treatment is not going to remove any of these things. No, right now there is no... no... Well, that's, there's such small concentrations, there's no way of mechanically, electrically, chemically take these things out in the, uh, at the concentrations you're finding. Right. 
there's no way to remove all. Of them. That's right. There, there's treatments that can remove some of them. Yes. Um, but there's nothing that exists. But I, I'm not even sure that you can do that on a huge scale that we go sewage in the United States in such a way that you could remove any one of them. Right. And they and one of you know one one thing that did show some promise was chlorination removed. Okay, of course. But when you chlorinate some of these, you actually you produce even yeah. more yeah. toxic. Yeah. You know, the yeah. metabolites of these once they're chlorinated yeah. can be even worse than what you started with. So it's the you know the only way to do is to yeah. stop it on this end. <laughs> it's it's, a, it's an interesting problem. I mean, you know, when you yeah. think about it, you know, there they are. But well, what are you going to do about it? Right. Nothing. Right. And um, Silent Spring actually looked at sewering or sewage treatment plants compared to septic systems to see if you know wastewater treatment plants do a better so. job. And they didn't. No. It was equivalent because a lot of what when they're removed it happens during the biological process which yes. happens in a septic system or a sewage treatment plant. So that didn't make it. the only benefit of, of, of sewering would be you would have them in one. You know, you don't have thousands of different septic systems that came into one. You would only have one source of that. One great big one. One great big one, right. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you don't change the amount. You, know. <laughs> you mentioned septic systems and so forth. What about the, the fate of these compounds and the compost and the composting mm -hmm. process? Yes. Good question. <laughs> I, want, I, I, don't, I know it's outside mm -hmm. your research, but is there research being done? Um, well, Is there papers written on this? I, um, the, the county, George, at the county is doing it with his different, yes, with his different um, types of toilets, composting toilets. Well, on the base, you can. Well, it's a, it's, it's not like I don't know what the name what of this facility is. is. Yeah. yeah. Military. Yes. Um, he's looking at at how compost. You know, he's looking at these contaminants in some of his okay. systems. Let me get you. So when you talk about chemicals in the environment like this, and, and you question the risk, the risk is really a combination of the inherent toxicity of the chemical to various organisms and humans, and the exposure level. So you're looking at the exposure level, and the, and the other question, the other part of the equation is what is the inherent toxicity? And the EPA does require pharmaceutical companies, chemical companies, all of these manufacturers of these chemicals, to conduct testing to try to understand the inherent toxicity so that they can use that in a risk assessment to decide is this a bad actor in the environment. For a pharmaceutical that's sold in huge quantities like acetaminophen, they do a lot of testing. If it's a small drug that's, that's not going to be in the environment in large concentrations, they may require less testing. There's also a program to address this gentleman's question. Uh, the, the endocrine disruption screening program that's being run by the EPA, they're looking at 10,000 chemicals over a period of years to try to understand the endocrine disrupting effect, effects of, of all these chemicals uh, in the environment. So, so you're doing a great part of it to understand the exposure part, and they're also doing the, the effects part. Right. Words, they're looking at the effects on fish, on marine invertebrates, on insects, on plants, on you know, all of these non-target organisms to get an assessment of what is the impact of these chemicals on the organisms in the environment. And then we can use your data to say, okay, it's way too low, or, 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 or it's not, or, or, or it is a concern, we don't know that. Yet, yeah, there, especially their more, more recent work is a lot, in the past, a lot of the toxicity, toxicity <clears throat> stuff has been, this is the level that kills a fish. Right. And so that's not actually right. applicable. And then, and it's looked at one chemical at a time. Right. So, you know, we don't have, right. so there, it's hard, you know, it, there's no easy way to get at this. But yes, EPA is doing. When they do acute studies where they give them large quantity over a short period of time, they do chronic studies where you dose at low levels for a long period of time. We mm -hmm. do full fish life cycle studies where you start with a fish egg, you grow it up to a fish. That fish has eggs, and then you study the offspring of that fish, you know, exposed to various pharmaceutical chemicals and things like that. So that's all being done. Right, and I think and I think they're developing action plans based on this to Correct. what to do. And they will regulate at some point. Right. They'll decide if the risk is, then they'll regulate. Right. right. Now they don't have the data to know. Because, no, right. yeah, like, you know, the technology is just now 
available that we can start even detecting these things. So the hormones in the oysters, were they higher in areas where there were more people around them, or were they the same in every event that you have? That, that's a good question, <laughs> and I should look at that. Um, we, you know, we targeted areas that were higher density development anyway, so it would have been good to have one. I guess our Nantucket Harbor one might be a good control, you know, to, to look at. The other areas were probably all pretty high, um, but it, that would definitely be worth looking at. So, um, just last thing quickly, like, like you said, are you with EP? Yeah. No, I'm with a pri private uh, ecotoxicology testing. Okay. So we do all of the tests. Okay. So right, EPA doing a good job at the state level. California is a really good example. They are going to hopefully try to start incorporating monitoring for these contaminants into their basic monitoring program. They're, they have a a muscle watch program where they started to measure contaminants within the muscle tissue. So they're looking at going back to risk and um, you know persistence. They're looking at what what chemicals would be the most cost effective to start to include into their monitoring. So there 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 is there is work moving towards where we need to get with this. And I, again, just a quick slide recognizing all our collaborators and partners. It's been a you know a huge collaborative effort a lot of help from a lot of different institutions. EPA actually did measure 20 samples for us in July for, they have a targeted list that is, that um, is used to track wastewater. And so they did a, they, they, they donated analysis of 20 samples for us. Um, and all the other organizations that, that have helped, both on the logistics side collecting samples and also making sense of the data. Awesome.